And moving to our next item is a on the urgent oral. Uh, Mr. Pat Sheegan has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the motion. To ask the Minister of Health, given the increase in activity in private health care providers reported recently, what efforts he is making or has made to utilise the resources and capacity of private health care providers for the provision of public health services during the pandemic. And I call the Minister of Health. Um, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the spread of coronavirus is continuing to cause serious disruption to our health and social care system, uh, and elective care activity has had to be reduced, unfortunately, in an attempt to free up capacity, including staff, beds, and critical care services. The first and second waves of the pandemic place unprecedented demands on acute services, with elective work reduced or postponed, and the position has further de deteriorated during surge three. Given the, the impact of COVID-19 on health service operating capacity, I made it clear um, that all possible sources of additional capacity should be utilised. This has included securing theatre capacity from local independent sector health providers, and as has already been made aware, that this has allowed many hundreds of the most urgent and time-critical patients to be treated. From April to December 2020, approximately 3,900 patients um, have been treated by local HSC consultants in the three local independent sector providers. Um, provision for continued access to the three independent hospitals had been made up until the 31st of March 2021. However, given the impact of the third surge, I can confirm that we have recently secured a further 112 theatre sessions uh, for health and social care cancer and time critical patients. In addition to this, some capacity has been secured from Republic of Ireland private clinics, and discussions are ongoing with NHS England for in house and IAS capacity for Northern Ireland patients. I have recently approved the establishment of a new regional approach to ensure that any available theatre capacity across Northern Ireland is allocated for those patients most in need of surgery both during, surgery, uh, during surge and as we come out of this surge. This will include seeking to continue to fully maximise all available in-house HSC and independent sector capacity, both within and outside Northern Ireland. I call uh, Pat Sheegan for supplementary. Thanks to the Minister. Uh, and it must be absolutely devastating for anyone to get a cancer diagnosis uh, and then to be told that your treatment is going to be cancelled must be even more devastating. And we had three chief executives from Health Trust in last week, and we were told that in some cases the cancer will have spread before these people receive treatment. Can the minister tell us why he didn't scope out capacity in the private sector before the Health Trust made an announcement about the cancellations of treatment? Because this has made the situation all the more worse for those patients who do have that diagnosis of cancer. And can I also ask the Minister, uh, while I'm here, Joe Biden has brought forward a 200-page strategy for combating virus within two days of being in office. When is the Health Minister going to bring forward a strategy to deal with this problem? Um, I thank the Member. Look, he has raised this strategy time and time again. And what I've said to the Member time and time again is an executive strategy. The First and Deputy First Minister announced a COVID uh, executive task force so we could bring forward all the parts together. The member can shake his head all he wants in this regard, but he has to realise that every minister in the executive has a responsibility. I know members are on the other side of this. This House at times would want to put the full responsibility on me and my department, and I'll bring forward that as a health response. I always have, and I always will, but I bring forward recommendations to the executive who bring forward an executive strategy as a whole, as they did back in May. In regards to the utilisation and uptake of the independent sector, I have already said in the answer as well, between April and December of last year, we engaged 3,900 and supported 3,900 patients through that surge. What we have done in, in regards to this third surge and into this is actually gain further additional 112 theatre sessions from those independent providers. So we already have engaged and continue to engage to see what additional capacity they can supply. I call Jonathan Buckley. Mr. Speaker, the Minister will know full well acutely the 
catastrophic news for cancer patients during COVID-19, particularly with the cancellation of services. Given that some individuals and others waiting on planned elective surgery have been able to commission their own surgery through private and independent providers, is this not a worrying sign within the Department of Health, especially on a day like today where we have heard that the Department has had to give back £90 million of unspent money? What actions will the Department of Health take to utilise all available capacity in its own facilities and indeed the private sectors in Northern Ireland and further afield, including paying for the private treatment as many cancer patients, through no fault of their own, have had to borrow money to get the urgent um, treatment that they require at this time? Um, and I, I thank the member for his point. I think one of the things that has to be made clear is on during this surge, which actually was unlike the first and second surge, was those independent providers continue to support their, their own patients as well. Uh, and what we actually saw, um, or what we are actually seeing during this surge, which we hadn't seen, was actually the demand for private patients had not dropped, up, dropped off, but had actually increased. So where we were able to get that additional capacities in surge one and two, we weren't able to get it here because there is a large uptake of the private sector actually during this surge as well. But what we are welcome of is the additional supports that we are seeing from the private sector. And the member mentions you know, the financing of us actually utilising private sector capacity. Uh, and it is one of our critical tools in reducing waiting lists in general, not just due to COVID, but one of the largest challenges that we face as a department uh, in actually utilising that independent sector is non-recurrent funding. Because we can only go to those private sectors with a one-year allocation, a one-year pot, and what they need to increase their capacity to help reduce our waiting lists is actually that surety of three to five years funding so they can increase their facilities, increase their staff to actually start to eat into our waiting lists. And that's what we've been looking at, you know, back in new decade, new approach. And that was the approach that was actually committed to at that point in time. But while we work on one year financial cycles, it makes us hard to engage long term those independent providers. Call Carol Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister uh, coming forward to the House today. Uh, Minister, um, while I appreciate the immense pressures which the health service is under, I think COVID has been truly revealing uh, of the decades of underinvestment into our health care system here in Northern Ireland. Uh, does the Minister foresee that in addition to these red flag surgeries, this could lead to more routine surgeries taking place in private medical facilities? I think following on from, from the Member's point in regards to that underinvestment of our health service, I believe, unfortunately, now we are paying the price of that underinvestment, not just in staff, but also facilities as well. And that's why, you know, when we look at our, our waiting list in regards to even elective inpatient day case procedures, the only way that we'd be able to make a serious uh, attack on those uh, ever-increasing numbers actually is actually utilising uh, the independent sector as much as we possible. But as a, as a response that I, I gave to, to Mr Buckley in, in my previous answer, until we get that long-term surety of recurrent funding of actually how we can address and eat into those waiting lists. It makes that a different relation, difficult relationship because one of the things when I met them just over a week ago, they said to me, the one thing they reminded me of was that they were already part way through a financial year where we were using independent sector when the then minister who was in place at that time actually cut all funding for the utilisation of the private sector and that's when our waiting lists actually started to escalate again and actually increase. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last Thursday, uh, I was present when the member bringing this uh, urgent oral uh, uh, question uh, made derogatory remarks uh, questioning the professionalism of 110 medics from the uh, British military who are going to offer support to the hard pressed staff in our uh, NHS. Uh, how would the minister respond to those remarks uh, given the call? of the member on the other side of the chamber uh, to seek additional help from the private sector. And I, I thank the member um, for raising the point. And, and I will say, and I said it in an earlier answer, and I have said it since taking up this post, uh, I will take help for whenever we need it, wherever our staff need it, wherever our health service need it, needs it. Uh, a lot of detailed planning has taken place to make sure that the military technicians who are being supplied have all the support they need to hit the ground running. Uh, this will include uh, welcome and induction to our hospital systems, including uh, the testing requirements and vaccination, clinical and local induction, 
uh, including uh, infection prevention control and donning and doffing, fit testing, everything that's needed. Uh, these will be a welcome addition uh, to our workforce at a time when they need that critical uh, support as we work through this third se se surge where we're seeing an, uh, over 800 patients currently in pa inpatients and over 70 people in ICU at this moment in time. So all help is welcome. I call Paula Bradshaw. And as the chair of the All Party Group on Cancer, I appreciate other members raising the issue of the cancelled and postponed um, surgery. Um, so I will move on from that. So you've addressed that issue. But private health care providers also extend to allied health professionals like physiotherapists, um, etc. And I'm just wondering what way are you engaging with them in terms of taking forward um, support services for long COVID? Thank you. Um, and I thank the member. And the issue is long, of long COVID and our supports is something the member has championed um, exclusively, I think, since, since we entered even our first wave. Um, she will be aware that I have asked the Health and Social Care Board to bring forward a response as to what that provision will look like. And I am quite open in saying uh, that if we do have to look to those private suppliers and private providers to actually bring that additional support in to support long COVID patients as well, so that we can actually start to work on our extended and in increasing waiting lists, we will do that. Call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member, uh, Mr. Sheehan, for bringing us. I suppose uh, the point is, it's not about just going to the private sector, but um, bringing those beds, those capacity, those staff, and the control and direction of the NHS. Um, I give them we're almost a year into this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, and we're plagued, we have been plagued by shortages. Can the minister inform us if this issue has been raised at the executive before? And if so, what's the political rationale for opposing uh, the moves uh, proposed in this question? Thank you. I'm not sure there is any political objection anywhere across any of the five parties within the executive as to the utilisation of the private sector to actually support our current health service or actually work to reduce the waiting lists. So I'm not sure of the, of the, the press up of the, the member's question and what is actually inference, because I have full party support in the executive for the utilisation of the private sector to help reduce waiting lists. And that's also seen as a commitment uh, in next year's budget as well. It's also a commitment a new, new decade, new approach that we would use all, all available avenues uh, to reduce our waiting lists. We call Alex Easton. And uh, welcome the minister's uh, statement there, um, Minister. I, I welcome the, the use of the, the 110 army medics, uh, which Mr. Sheehan seems to have an issue with, and it's even more astounding, um, Mr. Speaker, when Mr. Sheehan's already broken the COVID rules uh, and is pretending to be more caring. Uh, about how we deal with COVID and the staff when he's broken the rules of the regulations on COVID himself. But my, my question to you, Minister, is um, in terms of using the independent private sector, which we're doing, we also, uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, were calling for extra retired doctors and nurses to come out of retirement to help. And that doesn't seem to have been utilised fully. And I was wondering where we are in trying to get more of those people to come out of retirement to help. Um. And again, I think the member. One of the, the things that we did do was, uh, especially under this, we have again was re, re establish uh, and reopen our workforce appeal um, to date. Uh, uh, well, sorry, as of the 13th of January, a total of 1,049 uh, part-time or, or recurrent workforce appeal positions have been filled. Uh, this covers 646 appointments within the health and the social care sector and 403 appointments within clerical and admin. So we are making utilisation of that workforce appeal during this third wave as well, because they were brought in in different waves to fill certain slots at certain times. So it wasn't a full-time position uh, that many of those people sought in the first wave, but we are utilising that till yet again. Call Justin McNulty. Minister, I agree with your stance, all hands on deck for the health service. And if a loved one is in critical care and uh, they are in need of medical personnel, they will not care where they come from as long as they get the care that they need. Um, can the Minister advise what areas in the independent sector are being asked to consider helping out in the, in the NHS? Is it in cancer care or is it in orthopaedics or what particular areas might help out? Um. I think one of the things when we look to our three, three service providers that we actually have here in Northern Ireland, they do actually bring different skill sets with them. One is mainly orthopaedics, and that's in the northwest. Uh, so we are utilising their facilities and their staff as to the best fit 
of what they can supply, but it's mostly about the provision of theatre staff, theatres and those intensive care. So will we can move forward um, actually with the provision of cancer and time critical patients and that's been brought forward and those patients will be brought forward using that regional approach so those, those that most, most are in need of access in that capacity actually can. I call Gary Middleton. And can I thank the Minister for his responses so far? Um, I, I do welcome the steps that the Minister has taken uh, to try and address the pressures. Uh, we heard from the Finance Minister earlier in relation to the £90 million underspend uh, from the Department for Health. Uh, Minister, can you give some detail as to the reason for that? I appreciate that much of that finance will be ring-fenced, but some of the, the public will find it difficult to understand how there could be an underspend given the, the pressures, but I would just welcome maybe some clarity, Minister, in terms of how that has come about. No, I, I, I think the member for, for his point, and I think one of the challenges that we faced when we did receive such significant allocations uh, during this financial year, and especially to the tail end of this year, that had to be spent by the 31st of March. That is where the challenges come. If I had year-end flexibility that I could roll into to next year, into the, the further year, or actually have a multi-year budget, I could utilise that money five times over. But the difficulties in our accounting system, the fact that we are in a one-year uh, budget that is non-reoccurrent, puts that additional challenges of being able to spend. And I think the Minister of Finance highlighted that. Now, we have been looking uh, at different avenues, creative avenues, as to how we can retain money and spend money as well. And one of the things we actually did look was utilising uh, the independent sector. But one of the challenges from an accounting point of view, and that's what, what, is, what has often beat us, in, um, or beat us in, in, in many of these steps, is the fact that the money had to be spent in a year. So it's not as if we could carry any of that £90 million over into next year to actually further uh, utilise independent sector provision, something I would like to do. And something when the Finance Minister himself said, I think in a statement earlier on, that he was actually approaching Treasury uh, to look about further being able to roll that money over into next year. I wish him every success, because I can assure the member, if he does receive that sort of, of flexibility and that sort of ability, my department will be able to utilise it and not be bidding for it. Call Paul Given. Um, I am struggling to understand the argument that the NHS does not have capacity whenever I know consultants that work for the NHS are carrying out the same surgeries that they had planned to do in the private independent sector. So can the Minister explain what is the uh, problem in the NHS in terms of that lack of capacity when it does not seem to exist in the independent sector? And whenever the surge plans were being made, why is it that citizens today, and I know of some who are able to commission their own surgery, and they can't afford it, they're borrowing money to do it, they have been able to do it, and yet the NHS, with its huge resources, haven't been able to use up all of the capacity in the private independent sector to supplement the NHS's reduction in terms of what they're providing? And I, th I thank the member for, for his point. It's something that we've often said in here as well. While consultants may have capacity, um, our capacity and challenge actually lies within our ICU staff and the anaesthetists and the rest of the theatre staff that we actually need to support, not just the surgeon, but also the patient during their, during their operation and during their aftercare. And that's where those years of underfunding has left us, where the independent sector is able to pick it up because they have uh, the workforce in place. In regards to picking up that spare capacity, as I said in previous answers, what we actually did see uh, during the first wave was a lot of those patients who were actually utilising the private sector for their own use actually started to cancel operations, whereas this time they haven't. So there's a larger increase of the private sector still utilising private capacity uh, for what is a fee-paying uh, business for them. Now they have. Uh, through working with ourselves, actually increased their theatre capacity, as I said, an extra 112 uh, theatre allocations uh, between now and the end of March, which allows us to put more, more patients actually through. But I think one of the things that we do need to be clear of, Mr Speaker, as well, that um, even from, from, from where we stand, uh, between the 12th of January and the 18th of January, 4,262 elective procedures were carried out within the NHS. Uh, so it's not as if we've come to, to a complete standstill. Uh, and that in regards to those inpatients and day case uh, admissions as well. So that work still does go on. And for the number of cancellations, I sincerely apologise to those, but I can assure anybody that is having an operation or a procedure cancelled that we are doing our utmost to get them back in and get them seen. Call Robbie Butler. 
Speaker. Thank the Minister for his, his words today. And the, and the Minister has been absolutely resolute uh, and honest in his admission many months ago as he would take help from wherever it needed to come and he would seek help from wherever he could get it. Um, there are many people struggling at the moment, Minister, whether that's COVID or through these red flags. But this executive has a role to play uh, in that, in protecting people. So it's not just the intervention, it is the prevention. Uh, this is now our second wave and it's very serious. Um, would you agree with me, Minister, and what advice would you give to your executive colleagues that we, the executive needs to be in its COVID response strategy, uh, uh, speaking from a singular voice when it comes to the adherence to restrictions and of setting an example in the same to prevent a third incidence like this? I think the member makes a valid point, and it's something that I've always said, that the executive in this assembly works strongest when it stands together with that single voice supporting our health service, um, because that's what our health service workers need to hear. They need that reassurance that this place has their back uh, at all times, and that when it comes to, to regulations and when it comes to the enforcement and compliance of those regulations, that not only the executive steps up and sets an example, but every member of this House uh, steps up and set an example as well, because I believe that's what the people of Northern Ireland expect from us, but I also believe that that's what our health service workers actually deserve from us as well. And uh, members, that concludes this item of business, and I'll ask people to take a raise for a moment or two. Thank you.